Coming to you from Byram, Mississippi, is a church where every member matters. It's Lakeshore Church, and we are so glad for you to join us this morning. The message comes from Senior Pastor Jay Frazier as he shares from God's Word. Our goal is that everyone find a place to serve God in and outside the church. We worship and celebrate our relationship with God and strive to bring others to the cross of salvation. And now we join Pastor Jay Frazier. Did you know that in Matthew 18, 20, it says where two or more gathered together in His name, that He would be in the midst? That's really the reason we're here with you today. Because I'm here and you're here. That's the minimum of the scripture. And it says God's going to use this. And I believe today that God has ordained this time in His sovereignty for you to hear the Word of God. And we're excited about being a part of it. So enjoy today. But if you're able, will you stand with us in honor of God's Word? Still today, it's in or out. Uh, one verse of scripture found in Luke chapter 2 that, that sort of captures, it's the only verse uh, about this person. It says this, Then she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in cloth and laid him in a feeding trough because there was no room for them at the lodging place. Let's pray together. We thank you, God. What a wonderful, wonderful spirit we have in this place today. Not an essence, not just the result of people coming together and being cordial to each other. But God, you said if we would gather together in your name, you would be here. I've sensed you very near today. I thank you for the healing of heart that you've done today. I thank you, God, for the encouragement. I thank you for your spirit that we sense today. And Holy Spirit, we just ask you to continue. Would you speak to each one of us? Show us, Lord, whether you are in or out of our life. Show us, Lord, whether we have invited you in and you reside or we have pushed you away. God, you know where we're going, and I pray, my, God, my words would be yours, my thoughts would be yours. Most of all, obedience. Every one of us, including myself, would walk in obedience to what we hear. God, we would be careful to give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. It is simply amazing. Seems like I say this probably half the year. But it is amazing. Maybe I say it because I'm 50-something. Maybe I say it because literally how fast the year goes by. I can remember my parents, and one of them said it over the, the, the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, talked about how fast time goes by. And anytime you mention that, they say, just wait. I remember them saying that when I was in my 20s, and they would say stuff like, you just wait till you're in your 50s. Wait till you have kids. Wait till you have multiple kids. Wait till you have kids in college and one in high school and another one in middle school. Wait, just wait. You, you think it goes fast now. And they were telling the truth. It flies by. Now, I think it flies by some because we enjoy what we're doing. I've noticed that. When you're not enjoying what you're doing, I mean, time stands still. Is that the truth? Uh, just recently, I mean, and then, and you're in something, I had a couple of times recently, I was enjoying what I was doing, and it was like time was double time. I mean, it was over. It's amazing. It's amazing how I think the psychology of it works. But let me announce to you, it's Christmas time. But with Christmas in mind, and, and we've been doing these Bible characters, I hope you've enjoyed them as much as I have. It's been intriguing, you know, a couple of years back I thought this, is that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with Christmas characters, if you will, leading up to Christmas, even including Christmas Day. So today we've chosen the first character for Christmas to be the innkeeper. What's unique about the innkeeper is we have absolutely no evidence of him. We have not one part of his personality, how he handled them. We don't have anything about him, but we know somebody told Mary and Joseph... There's no room. Somebody acknowledged. Now I've grown up in the day with the, with the, the, the glass, or with, should say with the colored signs, you know, that say vacancy or no vacancy. You know what I'm talking about? Before we had the internet and before we had smartphones that you can make a reservation when you're riding down the road and you get tired, you know you're not going to make your destination, so you make a reservation on the phone. You know what I'm talking about? It's amazing the day and age we live in. I remember the day when you pulled up in a town and you were tired and your parents were tired and they thought, well, we'll just pay the money and stay at a hotel. And you were always looking for the sign. And this is what you want the sign to say. You wanted it to say vacancy so that you could stay. Hopefully it was a clean, decent motel. Or if they were full, it would say no vacancy. You remember those? You don't see that much anymore, I think, because of the, the Internet and all the technology that we have today. They were simply told there was no vacancy. The innkeeper told them that there was no room in the inn for them. 
And yet I want to I wanna apply this today to where you and I live, is that I believe that can be said about our lives as well. We know today when I think about this question or this thought, you give a few minutes to this idea, do I let him in, into my life, just like the innkeeper had a chance, or do I turn him away? And I believe we have some representatives, we have some representation that's, that's in our spiritual world, spirit world as we, as we speak. Salvation to me represents that there was a time and place in my life when I let Christ in. Salvation is that, when I open the door of my heart and ask Him to come in and be my Savior and just forgive me of my sins. But I also want to let you know that there's some other ways that we show whether we've let Him in or not. I believe surrender to the Lordship of Christ also represents letting Christ in. I say this, and this probably won't make me many friends, but I'm concerned today about theology, that we talk so much about being saved, and yet it seems like the modern church talks very little about living right after you're saved. Now just follow along with me now. I really struggle that I let him in my life. He becomes a part of who I am and yet I go live the way I want to and I, and I hope everything's right while I'm doing it. See, I believe when Jesus comes in the heart and he comes in the life, he makes a difference in that life. I'm concerned. I'll show you some scripture at the end today. I'm really concerned today that some people that name it, maybe even claim it, Maybe they profess it, but they don't possess it because it hasn't changed their life. There's so much. Surrender. Surrender to, to Christ. Surrendering my life to Christ and allowing Him to lead God, direct my life is also a representation of Him being in. Again, I say when we open the door of our life and He comes in, I think He makes a difference. Let me give you a couple of others. Settling a sin issue in, in your life, I think represents Christ being in your life. I've noticed in my life, and I'll just tell you how it works, God doesn't let me get away with it. We've gotten real good at getting away with it. And somehow or another, we've separated salvation theology from forgiving theology. And what I mean by that, if God's on the inside of me and I've invited Him to come in, He doesn't let me get away with it. He doesn't let me get away with it when I hurt Suzanne, you know. And I said this, and a lot of times I cut up about her. But let me tell you something. And I, please don't amen. This is going to hurt my feelings badly. But I'm the one that messes up the majority of the time in my marriage. Listen, I'm married way up. I outpunted my coverage for all you college sports fans, you know. We've got some hurting people here today that, that follow college football. I just want to encourage you today. I figured we'd have maroon on one side and, you know, blue and red on the other side this morning. You couldn't even sit together after yesterday. But the, the, the thought I want you to share, just listen to me. With, with God on the inside, when I sin, God is after me. The hounds of heaven are after me to make that right in my life. If I hurt Suzanne by something I say, God lets me know that and I've got to get it right. The Word of God says, how can you love me whom you haven't seen if you don't love your neighbor whom you have? I have no closer neighbor in my life than Suzanne. Listen to me. So, the, so we settle a sin issue. When something's not right in our life, we must get it right because that demonstrates that Jesus lives on the inside of us. How have we gotten so good at theology that we can departmentalize salvation when I accepted the Lord and yet I'm not coherent and I'm not conscious of how I'm living for Him and allow God to walk me through that too? Pretty good stuff. Let me give you one more. I think speaking for Christ represents letting Him in as well. What motivates us? Hmm. Why do we become concerned? You notice this? Somebody knows Christ, they become concerned about where other people stand with Christ. We just a few months ago, we talked about Andrew. Andrew met the Lord. They were already a follower of John the Baptist, but he met the Lord. And immediately he left Jesus and went and got Peter and said, Come on, brother, you've got to see who I met. Samaritan woman at the well, she met Jesus, told her everything she'd ever done, left her earthly water pot, her most essential item of her life. She left that water pot to go tell others that she had met the Christ. Matthew, if you remember the tax collector, society didn't love him. He was an outsider. He made his, he made his living on the backs of others. But when Matthew met Christ... It says immediately he made a supper. He prepared a supper in his home and invited all of his cohorts, all of those other guys that nobody loved, so that they could meet Christ as well. The point I want to make again is if Christ lives within us, he changes us. 
I've seen so many people that come to know Christ and the next thing you know, they got their, they got their husband or wife, they got their child, they got their neighbor, they got their co-worker because they want that co-worker to experience Christ the way they have. My pastor is in glory now for three years, but I think what he used to say, one of the problems with Christians today is they get over being saved. We, we, somehow or another, we departmentalize salvation from the rest of our life. You say, preacher, why are you hanging on that? Why are you hedging on that so much? Let me tell you, I can't tell you how many people I've heard basically say, don't worry about me, I'm saved. But today we've got to understand that the innkeeper had an opportunity to take Jesus in and he pushed him away. You and I have opportunity today to take Jesus in. No matter, no, matter where, no matter where you are in your journey, take Him in and allow Him to do in your life what He wants to do. Oh, listen, still today, it's in or out. Today, I want to share with you some things that really represent where we're going. Simply this is that all of us are the innkeeper. And there are four things I want to share in, in light of that. All of us are the innkeeper. Here it is. Number one is the opportunity is ours. When I think about taking Jesus in, the opportunity is ours. Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He wants to come in. He desires and I know that Mary was carrying him and it was the opportunity. You'll hear more about this in a few moments, what opportunity he had, but the opportunity is ours. It was the innkeeper's chance to make a difference in the Messiah's life for him to take care of Mary and Joseph in the birth. But yet he's remembered in a negative way instead of a positive way. So represents people's life. The opportunity is ours. Listen, it represents all humanity. Jesus comes to all. Revelation 3.20, a verse that we often mention in salvation settings. But I want to share the background with you. Revelation 3.20 was shared in the Laodicean church age. And Jesus had talked about that church age and what they had done wrong and the things that were going on. But then the summation of it is, in your veering and in your going away from me, I will stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and I will eat a meal with you. I will sup with you and you with me. And we use that in salvation is fine, but it's also said for the person who strayed. It's said for the person who accepted him as their savior and they walked away from God and they began to love other things more than they love God. Today, God stands at the door and knocks. And if you and I hear his voice and open the door, he will come in. You know, it's amazing how much we've changed because of technology. I grew up in the day and age where people had the praying hands on their, on their dining room table or the coffee table. You remember that? Remember the praying hands? I grew up in the age when they, we had the pictures of the, of the Lord's Supper up on the wall. You remember that? And it had all that decoration. And sometimes it was the frame. You, the frame was so decorated you were afraid to walk by because you're going to mess it up. But I also remember another one that you saw often in people's homes. I think we have one here in the church that I've seen. But there's a picture that shows Christ at the door and he's knocking. You remember that picture? And as Jesus in all of his decor is, is there knocking, you'll notice something about that door. If you look at the picture real close, who made that portrait is, is this, is that there's no doorknob on the outside. God set it up in such a way that that door, the door of your heart, will never have two doorknobs on it. It only has one. And if you're going to have anything from God beginning with salvation, but even after salvation, if you're going to have God's work in your life, you always open the door. God never knocks it down. He'll knock, you on your, he'll knock on the door, but he won't knock it down. We need to understand the way that it works and understand simple, simple theology is the opportunity is ours. God stands at the door and knocks even today. And just understand that once again, the context of this verse, it wasn't just the lost people needing to open the door. It was a person that had walked away from God and done things in their life that wasn't right. When God shows them the error of their way, He expects us to seize the opportunity that we have to make it right with Him. Not only is the opportunity ours, but number two, when I think about the innkeeper, I see us again. The second thing is no room I feel far too many times has become the indictment of humanity. Again, the decision is ours. But far too many times in the average person's life, including, including Christians, something happens and we become too full, too busy. And therefore, all along, we push God aside. Oh, we've got time for everything else. We've got time for everything under the sun, but we don't have time for the sun in our life. We start out well, but today, for whatever reason, our plate got fuller and responsibilities took hold and, and overwhelmed us. And now we have no room. Lord, I have no room for you. You know how much stuff I've got going on. We've got, we've got time for this and time for that, but we don't have time for the very one that created the opportunity for us to be blessed. 
Oh, too often it, it fits. Someone said about the enemy in this day and age we live in. The enemy doesn't have to set us up to be bitter. All he's got to do is set us up to be busy. Because we can be so busy that we don't, we don't have time to spend with the Lord. What I found out in my own devotional life this past week, just reading. I have a book that I've been reading for years, and, and I'll go through times. So I don't do it every day, but it, it's just a phenomenal read for me. It just fits. And, and, and this very week I was reading one morning, and this is what the devotion said. Far too many times, Lord, I'm wide open, but yet you ask me to wait. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. You and I, we think if we get a little faster, if we do more, God will be more pleased. No, really what God wants today, hear this church, what He wants today is you. And when He has you, He can mold you and make you into what you need to be. <laughs> Instead of this wide open world that we live in often affects us as a child of God. All of us are the innkeeper. I believe very much so that no room, no room is the indictment of humanity. We're so full. We've got so much going on. Preacher, quite honestly, I, I like your sermon today, but I really don't have time. Fits. Two more when I think of the innkeeper. I wonder, or I know this, surely he didn't know the end. He didn't know. He didn't know who was in front of him. If he would have known, listen to me, if he would have known who was in front of him, he would have kicked somebody to the curb. Do y'all believe it? If the innkeeper would have known that Mary was favored of God and was carrying the Messiah, somebody would have been thrown out of their room. He didn't know. Reminds me of a story. I'll try to tell it quickly. It happened here in Mississippi. I was coming over. I'll leave the hotel out of, out of the name because it's still in business. I'll never stay there, but I will put some of my kin folks, if they come, I will put them there. Several years ago, I was pastoring in Georgia, and I was coming over here for a board meeting. And uh, this is the way I used to do it, because I don't trust still even technology today. I figure somebody will lose it. So I made a reservation. I had the lady in my office make a reservation, and I'm one of those. that uh, you, you make it on the 800 number at that time. Now you do it on you know, a website or whatever. But uh, I, I was always one that I want to call the individual motel. I actually called the hotel and told them that I was coming in late, and I made mean, make sure the room, yes, sir, your room is fine. I got there about 2 o'clock in the morning, maybe 2.30. I had to do Wednesday night service. The, my meeting was on Thursday. It just had to work out that way. I didn't have a Bo Lawrence. I didn't have, a, I didn't have any other staff. I had to do it. And so after Wednesday night was over, I got in my truck and I headed over here. Drove, I got here literally in the middle of the night, closer to the morning light than the middle of the night. I mean, it was late. I walk in to get my room now. We've made a reservation on a... 800 number now, I'm, I've called you to remind you that I'm coming. Yes, sir, we've got your reservation. I walk in at 2.30 in the morning, thereabouts, and they don't have a room for me. To say I was hot might be an understatement. I was trying to act like Jesus, but probably wasn't doing too well. I was subscribing to the verse that says, be angry and sin not, okay? <laughs> so we go back and forth, and I told her the whole story just like I told you. The reason I called you was that I have enough. I got to go to bed. I got to get up, you know, be Jesus tomorrow. But anyway, I said, man, would you call the manager? <laughs> she said, call the manager. I said, yes, would you call the manager? Right now, call the manager. Get him, get him on the phone. Her, him or her on the phone. She said, I can't do that. He's asleep. I said, that's what I want to be. So you know, get him on the phone. The rest of the story goes like this. When she got him on the phone, they found a room. That's sort of unique to me. But you know what happened? I think what happened was after I called those couple of days, probably that night, somebody came in about 7 or 8 o'clock. They didn't come in at 2. And they thought, you know what? I bet that guy's not going to show up in the middle of the night. Who would? So they gave my room to somebody else. If the innkeeper would have known, he'd have kicked somebody out. But he didn't know. The point I want to make is this. Look, listen to me. Everybody listen. Everybody listen, listen to me. We have 2,000 plus years to look back. God has established, you're going to see it in about five minutes, God has established in His Word that to be God's, to be right with God, to know God, God has to live in you. Not around you. Not, not, not He, well, He knows me. No, no, no. We're not talking about a knowledge. We're talking about an experience. 
And that's where the church has dropped the ball today. Somehow or another, we think we can come to church enough, we can tithe enough, we can pray enough, we can read the Word enough. All those are important, but that's not knowing Him. Because knowing Him is not whether I'm in Him, but whether He is in me. You with me? See, surely He didn't know. Let me tell you something, church. Every one of you here know because I just told you. Hmm? I'm looking around. I don't see anybody napping. Hmm? You got to have him in. Listen to me. We've educated it away. We ignore it. I read stuff on a regular basis. I'll see an article on the internet and say, man, I want to read that. And I'll read three paragraphs and it's some pagan person that's telling me that all I believe in Christ is false. It's out there. And it's out there by the thousands and thousands and thousands of articles of people today that are disproving and delegitimizing the Word of God, that are watering, around, watering down and ignoring what God said was truth. So we need to understand this. The innkeeper might get a pass because he did not know who was in front of him. Today you and I don't get a pass because we know who stands in front of us. We know who paid the price. We know who paid and died on the cross for us. We know he paid it for us, you and me. We don't get a pass. The innkeeper might get a pass. <laughs> we don't get one. Oh, listen, the Holy Spirit is here today to reveal and convict and confirm where we are with Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 says, The Spirit of God bears witness with my spirit and lets me know I'm a child of God. Well, we can sing that song, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The reason I can feel a little chill starting my big toe, and it's a big one too, by the way, and it goes up my shin and around my knee and into my hip and up my back and out the top of my head is because I know him, and he knows me. It's not left a chance. I know him. Mm -hmm. He that has the Son has life. And let me tell you something. I'll stand with every fiber of my being and tell you you can know it. Well, preacher, I hope I am. Oh, no, today you can know it. And let me tell you, if you don't know it, I believe with every fiber of my being, you can, come to a, you can come to an altar just like that, and before you go home, you will know it. Because I know it. I can take you to the place where God did it. And He continues to do it in my life. He doesn't let me get away with sin. He doesn't let me get away with slothfulness in my life. He doesn't let me get away with apathy and complacency. He doesn't let me get away with rationalizing things in my life that don't bring glory and honor to Him because He's God and like Him there's none other. It's good stuff. I feel that chill all over my back. I feel like that's God honoring me for the stand we're taking today. This one more point is for me. You don't have to receive it. It's just when we were putting this together, it just hit me. And I want to share it with you. When I think about the innkeeper, I'm going to have this put up there. Put up there, guys. When I think about him, the innkeeper, I wonder, did he ever know? Did he ever know? Five years after Christ was born, ten years. We don't have, we don't have anything about him. We don't know how old he was. We don't know if mom and dad put him at the register, <laughs> you know. And they went to bed early. We don't know. We don't know if he was a teenager that mom and dad were making him work behind the desk that night. We don't know. We don't know if he was old and decrepit. Huh? I won't name anybody here that reminds me of that. No, that's what I'm talking about. We don't know. We don't have one bit of reference about the innkeeper. Not one thing. So we don't know. That's good for preachers because we can just make it up then. But I wonder, this thought crossed me. And this is just for me, but this is just captivating me. I wonder if he ever knew. I wonder, did he live long enough to know who he had in front of him? And he pushed him away. I often say this in sermons when I preach this. I'd never thought about that before. It's got to be a God thing. Think along those lines. Did you know, did you know the probability? <laughs> I love probability. This might surprise you. If I wasn't called to preach, I might be a math teacher today. I love math. I love numbers. I, I love applied stuff that you can figure out, you know. I don't like that what happened in 1368 at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I just, I love history more now than ever. But I like trying to work stuff out. Math's part of that. I, I love it. I love talking to people that are challenged in math. That really makes my day. But you know the probability, think about this. There are hundreds of prophecies 
But did you know the, prob the probability of eight of the prophecies of Christ and him being born in Bethlehem and no room in the inn? There's plenty of them. Just eight of them? The probably is one and one hundred quadrillion. Okay? Now, I can help you out today what a quadrillion is. You ready? All right? A quadrillion, one quadrillion is a hundred trillions. Excuse me, a thousand trillions. Now, if you go want to, you want to understand what that is, then go to the U.S. debt clock and it will show you what a trillion is. Okay? One quadri hundred quadrillion is a hundred trillions. Makes just that just blows my mind. The probability. So God is in it. <laughs> God did it, folks. You need to understand that. But I wonder if he ever knew. Today I say, you and I know. So in knowing, what, what do we do with him? Hmm. What do we do with him? It's amazing today how we've rationalized Christ wanting to be in our life and our relationship be up to date with him, how we've rationalized sin in our life. Amen? It's amazing how we rationalize things that are not right in our life. And I've shown you plenty today to let you know it's in us. Your relationship with Christ is not predicated what you're in. It's predicated of whether Christ is in you. That's where the church has gone wrong. We think if we can get them busy enough, involved enough, in the way, in the water, in the church... All those things are important in their own way. But what matters today is for you to be able to say... He's in me. Came with the great say. Look, look, here's, here's. The real question is this, of whether Jesus is in the inn. That's where the sermon title came from. You're the inn. The Word of God says that you are the temple of God. That Jesus doesn't want you to be in Him. Jesus wants Him to be in you. You see the difference? This will scare you to death. But i got to tell you this, probably everybody on the sound of my voice this morning is not going to heaven. Mm. Jesus took it up. He said, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter in. And they said to Jesus, listen, you're going to love this, please amen this part. But Lord, we pastored in your name. We cast out devils in your name. We did many wonderful works in your name to which Jesus will say to them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. Listen to me, church. I'm a few minutes from being through. Listen to me. So many times we need to understand this, and we miss it. It's literally, if you go and look, I'm not a scholar of Greek nor Hebrew. No. Mm -mm. But I do know this about that word. When it talks about he never knows us, it's like myself knowing Suzanne intimately. Two fleshes becoming one. Jesus living on the inside of me. It is not this, it's not this church tradition. It's not all these things we've come up with to do that represent who we are. No, all of those are byproducts because He lives in me.